Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Killer Psyche ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the app today. A listener note. This episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. In Greek mythology, it was believed that a person's life was predetermined. There were three divinities who controlled the human's life. They were known in the ancient Greek language as the morae, which translates to allotted portion or share. You might know them as the fates. The fates would weave a web and each thread would represent a human's life. But this did not mean there was not free will. Their actions and choices were predestined, but how they chose to react to them were not. The fates would watch each person and would take their response to any situation into consideration as they continued to weave. The three sisters each had their own role in deciding the course of a person's life. The first was Clotho. Known as the spinner, she would begin each person's thread when they were still in their mother's womb. After Clotho started the thread, she would hand it off to her sister Lachesis, the allotter. She determined the obstacles a person faced in their life and how long a human would live. And last but not least was Atropos, the inflexible. Atropos held the shears that cut each person's thread. She chose how each person would die, if they would have an easy death or a violent one. So it is fitting that one of the most dangerous poisons in the world is named for her. Atropa belladonna, also known as deadly nightshade or death cherries, is extremely toxic. All parts of the plant, from its roots to its flowers and berries, can lead to extreme illness and death. Atropine is derived from the nightshade family. It is used for some medications, eye drops, for example, and some people use it recreationally because it can have hallucinogenic side effects. But atropine can be fatal when one takes it in large quantities. This is a fact that Graham Young, only 14 years old, knew well from his extensive research into poisons. And he put that knowledge to use when he decided to poison his entire family. Mind of a Monster, the podcast from ID, is back, and this season they're covering The Butcher Baker. In the 80s, over 20 women go missing in Anchorage, Alaska. Women turning up dead in the woods, and others are kidnapped. But their stories are not taken seriously by the police, even though these crimes all point to one man. On this podcast, Uncover how serial killer Richard Hansen evades arrest for over a decade. And hear from the victims, along with police and Alaska State Troopers, who were there on the ground investigating this case. Listen to Mind of a Monster, The Butcher Baker, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Whether it's routine maintenance, an emergency repair, or a dream project, Angie lets you browse homeowner reviews, compare quotes from multiple local pros, and even book a service instantly. So the next time you have a home project, just Angie that and start getting the most out of your home. Download the free Angie mobile app today or visit Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I dot com. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, I'm Candace DeLong. And this is the third season of Killer Psyche.
I was a psychiatric nurse and then an FBI criminal profiler. In the five decades I've spent studying people's minds, I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their psyche to figure out what made them do what they did. This episode is Graham Young, the teacup poisoner. In 1961, 13 year old Graham Young was an avid reader and a fan of books about poisoners. He was also very knowledgeable about chemistry and he would often experiment in his home, but it was not enough. He wanted to experiment with human subjects. The first person to start feeling the symptoms of his poisoning was Christopher Williams. Williams was a classmate of Graham, who was also only 13 years old at the time. Graham added small amounts of toxins to his food until he got so sick that he could not attend school anymore. But once he left school, Graham could not observe how his experiments were affecting his subject. So he switched his sights to those who he would always have access to, his family. By the summer of that year, members of the young household began experiencing waves of nausea and stomach cramps. His father, Fred Young, suspected his son's chemical experiments immediately, but it never occurred to him that his son might be poisoning them intentionally. Graham Young himself was also experiencing the same symptoms as the rest of the family. Fred thought he was just being careless with his hobby. One morning in November of 1961, Graham served his older sister her usual cup of tea. She took a sip but it tasted uh, very sour, so she put it down and did not finish it. On her way to work, she felt ill, and I mean very ill. So she went to the hospital, and it was there the doctors found she had been poisoned by belladonna, also known, as I mentioned, as deadly nightshade. And just a little too much of it can kill you. After his sister's brush with death, Graham turned his attention to his stepmother, Molly. For months, he slowly poisoned her tea with increasing amounts of antimony. But despite multiple dosings, by the spring of 1962, Molly had not died. So Graham switched poisons and put thallium another highly toxic heavy metal in her tea. Well, it must have been a whopping dose because that afternoon, Fred Young stepped out to the family's back garden to find his wife on the ground writhing in pain as his son sat in a chair and watched. He rushed Molly to the hospital where after hours of agony, She mercifully died. The doctors ruled her cause of death to be the prolapse of a spinal disc. Why in the world they thought a slipped disc, which is never fatal, by the way, would be the cause of death of an otherwise healthy woman is beyond me. Nevertheless, that is what happened. His stepmother's death did not slow down Graham's rapidly growing compulsion to poison people. In fact, at Molly's wake, believe it or not, he poisoned a male relative by lacing a jar of mustard with antimony. Shortly afterwards, his father became seriously ill again and was hospitalized, but this time 
he was correctly told that he was suffering from antimony poisoning and was only, quote, one dose away from death. Around the same time, a couple of Graham's classmates also became ill with the same symptoms. His science teacher's spidey sense went on full alert, and so she decided to go snooping in his desk. And what did she find? She discovered several bottles of the poison, as well as books on infamous murderers. Both she and the headmaster devised a very clever trap. They arranged for Graham to be interviewed by a psychiatrist who would be posing as a career advisor, and he asked Graham about his interests. Not surprisingly, Graham revealed his extensive knowledge of poisons. In fact, he couldn't talk about it fast enough. And why not? He was very proud of his knowledge. Needless to say, the police were notified. In May of 1962, Graham Young was arrested. He confessed to poisoning his sister, father, a classmate, and fatally killing his stepmother, something he had not been suspected of. Unfortunately, they were never able to forensically tie him to his stepmother's death since she'd been cremated, and therefore he was not charged with her murder. A very learned psychiatrist diagnosed Graham when he was only 14 as having, and I quote, a psychopathic disorder rather than a mental illness and had failed to develop a normal moral sense. That's a very kind and clinical way of saying he's a heartless killer who hasn't yet and never will adhere to societal norms. He also stated it was extremely likely that Graham would reoffend. Graham was sentenced to 15 years at a maximum security psychiatric hospital. And at only 14 years old, he was among the youngest inmates. But did being incarcerated stop his criminal compulsions? No, it didn't even slow them down. Not one bit. Shortly after arriving, one of Graham's fellow inmates died of cyanide poisoning. It turns out that a particular shrubbery that grew around the hospital, if treated properly, cyanide could be extracted from it. On another occasion, a nurse found a toilet cleaning substance in her coffee cup, and another nurse found a missing packet of toxic soap in the tea urn. I could go on and on, but it's important that you see how overwhelming his compulsion to poison people was. He was not insane, not at all. He knew exactly what he was doing. But even being found guilty of poisoning people and locked away from society as punishment, he would not, or possibly could not, stop. It is true, serial killers and other types of psychopaths do not, well, what we would call learn. They don't learn from their mistakes by going to prison, meaning they don't say, hey, you know what? I shouldn't have done that. I'm never going to do it again. No, that doesn't happen. Once they're released, if they are, they're likely to go back to their old ways, but they'll just be careful not to get caught. But the garden variety serial killer once incarcerated, does not kill others around him. They play nice in the prison sandbox. They are ideal inmates, and it's all a part of their plan to trick the guards and parole board into thinking, oh, they've been rehabilitated and are therefore now a safe person to live among us. But Graham 
despite his high intellect, could not even control himself while incarcerated. And what does that tell me? His compulsion to kill by poisoning was uncontrollable, at least by any internal control, meaning he could not put the brakes on poisoning. Now here's something. After only three years of a 15-year sentence, he applied for early release. At his parole hearing, his own father and sister advised the board that none of his relatives would house him. And Graham's own father told them, quote, he should never be released. Graham's application was denied this time. Five years later, a different psychiatrist actually believed that he had cured Graham Young. This is what he actually said to the parole board. Graham was no longer obsessed with poisons, violence, and mischief. And he is no longer a danger to others. I'm not kidding. This psychiatrist referred to poisoning people to death as mischief. What? You're kidding me, right? You cured a psychopathic killer? How did you do that? Obviously, this shrink doesn't know when he's being lied to. In the 10 years I was in clinical psychiatry, I worked with a lot of truly great psychiatrists and a few crackpots who, in my opinion, were in the wrong line of work. But among the great ones, we always had one psychiatrist who, no matter what the pre-admission behavior of their patient was accused of, even murder, they truly believed that they and they alone could cure their patient of whatever ailed them. I called it the these hand syndrome, meaning if I lay these hands upon you, you will be cured. Oh, if it were only that simple. Now, after being told he was being discharged after serving only half of his original sentence of 15 years, Graham said the following to a nurse. And I quote, when I get out, I'm going to kill one person for every year I've spent in this place. Hard to believe he was still released, and yet he was. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that the nurse did report it, but that she was ignored. Graham left the psychiatric hospital in 1971 when he was 24 years old. He did not return home, no surprise there. He ended up staying in a hostel, looking for work and making occasional trips to London to stock up on chemicals. Yes, I said that. Within only a few weeks of being discharged from eight years of confinement, he tried to buy some exotic poisons, but he was denied. So what does he do? he went back to his old standby, antimony. Well, there were those at the hostel who suffered signs of poisoning consistent with Graham's other victims, stomach cramps and vomiting. No one died, and poisoning was not suspected. He was soon hired as an assistant storekeeper at a photographic supply company. Soon after he started working there, Graham's boss, an older man about 59 years old named Bob, started having bouts of stomach cramps and dizziness. For months, his illness would fade when he took time away from work, but then they'd worsen again when he returned. Then, in July of 1971, Bob became desperately ill and died. The official cause of death was listed as pneumonia. After Bob's death, other employees at the lab started having strange symptoms, such as stomach pains, hair loss, 
and for some of the men, impotence. In November, about four months after Bob died, another worker died. By that point, over 70 employees had reported unexplained illnesses. And so the company began investigating possible leaks of chemicals or even radiation from their equipment. To reassure the staff, the lab's on-site doctor held an informational meeting. During the meeting, Graham publicly challenged the doctor, asking why the company was not investigating for thallium poisoning, since the chemical was commonly used in the photographic process. Now, why in the world would he do that? Challenge the doctor and bring attention to himself? Good question. And here's the answer. He did it quite simply because Graham saw himself as the supreme arbiter of, well, everything that could make someone sick. In challenging the learned doctor's remarks, Graham was playing with him a kind of catch me if you can, you stupid, stupid man. And I'm sure it made Graham feel great. However, it would turn out to be not only his greatest mistake, but also his undoing. Graham's in-depth knowledge of toxicology made the doctor suspicious. And he reported Graham's remarks about the thallium to the police. They executed a search and, sure enough, found evidence of thallium poisoning of many employees. And it wouldn't be long before they found out about Graham's previous conviction for multiple poisonings at the age of 14. Graham was arrested three days later, and officers actually found samples of thallium in his pockets. Yes, he actually had his weapon of choice on him. Makes sense, though. To me, anyway. Thallium was his one true love, and he kept it near and dear to his heart. They also searched his home, where they found a journal documenting the poisonings in detail. Now, you might say, why in the world would he keep a journal of his crimes? How stupid is that? You're right, of course. But it's also very common among compulsive offenders of any kind. Poisoners, arsonists, and especially child molesters. They write things down and keep the notes or diaries because it helps them relive the experience. And in Graham's case, it helped him keep track of how much of this or that he gave and to whom he gave it. Of course, for the police and prosecutors, it was a gift. Graham Young was charged with two counts of murder two counts of attempted murder, and two counts of administering poison. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. He was 24 years old. We get support from Audible. No matter what your goals are for the new year, tackle them with a partner like Audible. Audible has a growing selection of wellness titles in all categories, including physical, mental, social, motivational, and financial wellness. Audible Originals even have the Audible Sleep Collection, which are audio experiences created to invite relaxation and sleep. I am currently enjoying Why We Sleep, Unlocking the Power of Sleep and Dreams by Dr. Matthew Walker. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash psyche or text psyche to 500-500. That's audible.com slash psyche. 
Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. At Mint Mobile, we like to do the opposite of what Big Wireless does. They charge you a lot, we charge you a little. So naturally, when they announced they'd be raising their prices due to inflation, we decided to deflate our prices due to not hating you. That's right. We're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month slows. Full terms at mintmobile.com. Okay, so that's what we know about Graham from the time he was 13 up to finally being in prison for good when he was 24. But what happened before that? Graham Frederick Young was born in Nadson, North London on September 7th, 1947. When he was just three months old, his mother died of tuberculosis. When she passed, Graham's father was overcome by grief, leaving his infant son to be raised by his Aunt Winnie and his older sister to be raised by their grandparents. When he was two years old, the Graham family was reunited after Fred married a new woman named Molly. But all was not well, and being separated from his aunt, who he had bonded to as a primary mother figure, as soon as he was born, had a very detrimental effect on Graham's development, as well as his social skills and relationship with his new stepmother. It is entirely possible the sudden separation from his aunt mummy caused lasting damage to his personality. We know now that sudden maternal deprivation and at such a tender age two years old, can cause irreparable damage to a child's psyche and the development of normal attachments to other people. Graham was not a sociable child. He would rather read than make friends. Why is that? Well, children who suffer maternal deprivation, such as Graham did, may never learn to trust people. Why? because of the intense pain and subsequent damage from losing their original loving parent, damage to their psyche. As a result, they fail to attach and bond with any other would-be loving, caring, nurturing parent. And that means Graham's stepmother Molly never had a chance with him. Children that fail to attach to a parent Well, there's a name for it. It's called detachment disorder. And it's a mental disorder that limits the child's ability to both feel and express feelings and sentiments. It also impedes their ability to connect with the outside world. Hence, the excessive love of reading and avoiding playmates. Books are easy. The child does not have to interact or respond to a book, right? They can get lost in the story, fantasize, daydream. These days, you could switch out the word book for video games. Any solitary activity that is engaging will do. But to relate to other kids? Well, that's a whole different challenge and nowhere near as satisfying. The detached child's social skills suffer or they may not develop at all. The child finds little or no satisfaction being with other kids, so they become their own best friend. And in Graham's case, that was a very dangerous situation. During his childhood, Graham developed a fascination with both nonfiction accounts of murderers especially poisonings, and Adolf Hitler, whom he later claimed was misunderstood. This is probably not the first time you've heard about a serial killer being a fan of Hitler, a man generally regarded as one of the world's great villains. So what's up with that? 
Well, in broad strokes, both Hitler and the Nazi regime symbolize domination, control, but most of all, power. Power over the masses. Power on people they looked down on. Hitler wanted to rule the world and was pretty successful for a time. And I think serial killers are drawn to that because a big part of their killing fantasy is to have ultimate power over their victim. The godlike power to either let them live or take their life. The very idea of one person taking the life of another took on a very powerful meaning for the young and impressionable Graham Young, and it became an obsession. He began to fantasize about what it would be like to have power over someone and kill them. Soon enough, the way he wanted to kill them did as well, and poison became his weapon of choice. Why poison? Well, there are several reasons why many killers, serial and otherwise, use poison. And most of them are practical reasons. First of all, there is no face-to-face -face confrontation, such as stabbing, beating, or choking. It's not hands-on. It's not messy, and there is no blood involved, as there would be, like, say, in a shooting. The only thing necessary is that the killer have two things, access and proximity to the victim. And best of all, if done properly, the victim will never know what's happening to them until it is too late. Graham's obsession about poisons would become a hobby of sorts. By 13 years old, he had developed an encyclopedic knowledge of chemistry and toxicology. He used this knowledge to convince a local chemist that he was a 17-year-old university student purchasing chemicals for research. Yeah, he fooled a professional chemist. That is how knowledgeable he was. He got his hands on substances like antimony and arsenic, both of which are very toxic poisons. And that is when he began his experiments on humans. We've talked about Graham's early poisonings, including his stepmother, followed by his eight years in a psychiatric hospital. But is there anything else we can learn about him? Oh yes, there is much, much more to learn about his murderous psyche after he was discharged. He definitely was not cured. A deeper dive into his second round of killings at his job at the photo processing lab offers fascinating and revealing insight into just what made Graham Young tick. His victim list started out with his supervisor, Bob, a 59-year-old man, a nice guy, and he treated Graham well. Nevertheless, Bob was marked for extinction. But why? Was there a reason Graham chose him, or was it random? I think Bob represented someone else to Graham, someone he liked to kill but could not his father. Why do I think that? Remember, his father recommended to the psychiatric parole board that his son, and I quote, never be released. Now think about that for just a minute. Can you imagine recommending to a governing body about your 17-year-old son, who once was a cute little boy who sat on your lap toddled around your house, sat at your dinner table, played on the floor with his toys, came to you for guidance, showed off his report card to you, that you would recommend that about him? But before your son is even out of puberty, 
he poisons your wife to death and watches her die in agony, and then goes on to poison several others, including relatives and classmates. And all that time, you thought he was a budding scientist who one day would use his advanced knowledge of chemistry to help all mankind. And now you are saying, essentially, my son, this young man before you, is a menace to society and should not live among us. His father's words probably cause an indelible wound that would never heal. And what emotion frequently follows being hurt by someone? Anger. It's quite possible, even likely, I'd say, that Graham saw Bob as a father figure. He was an older man, as I mentioned, 59. He was in a position of power and authority over Graham, like his father had been. In Graham's twisted psyche, that meant Bob had to go. And let's not forget, Graham was already a serial killer and really didn't need an excuse to kill anyone, even Bob, no matter how benevolent he had been to his young protege. And by the way, it certainly would not be the first time a serial killer targeted someone they knew because they symbolized someone else they hated or merely annoyed them. And therefore, that person deserved to die. For the next few months, his poisonings were limited to small doses of antimony in his co-worker Diana's tea. Usually, according to Graham, quote, when she annoyed me. Found in his diary was the following, quote, Di irritated me yesterday, so I packed her off home with an attack of sickness. I only gave her something to shake her up. Now I regret that I did not give her a larger dose, capable of laying her up for a few days. Oh, how I do love a good confession. And that's the kind that can and will put you on death row. But are there clues to his psyche found there? I think so. That statement tells me that whoever wrote it is very sadistic, a sadistic killer. He enjoyed his victim's suffering. So a quick and painless kill was not what he wanted. He knew down to the last milligram how much poison it would take to make his victim mildly ill or kill them. For the poisoner, Everything short of a lethal dose is a little murder. Poisoning is what we call a passive-aggressive type murder. Unlike other killers who may get the ultimate thrill by killing with their own hands, poisoners are content to just set the scene and walk away, knowing the murderer will eventually travel in their wake kind of like disabling someone's car brakes, than just walking away. No doubt in my mind, the very thought of the victim's agony pleased Graham immensely. Just thinking about what they were going through was enough to put a smile on his face. Here's another example of his emotional sadism. One of his victims, Fred, A 56-year-old man was so disabled from a thallium poisoning that his central nervous system deteriorated to the point that he could not speak, had trouble breathing, and his skin began to peel off. To check on him, Graham frequently called his wife right at his bedside, but not out of concern for his colleague. Oh, no. He did it because just hearing about it would have pleased and excited him. And the power, just hearing the details, underscored the power he had. And that feeling, 
The power is his reward. And the reward for his success reinforces the behavior, all of it. Preparing the deadly concoction, putting it in someone's tea, even watching them drink it, that all reinforces the criminal behavior of the poisoning. As a result, that behavior becomes compulsive. And here's the thing about poisoners. They do not stop until they either get caught or die themselves. An earlier victim, a young man named Bet, was severely poisoned, but he survived. However, his hair fell out and the poisoning made him suicidal. Ultimately, he recovered, but he was left impotent. In his diary, Graham wrote that he felt some remorse for poisoning him. Quote, I feel rather ashamed of my action in harming Bet. That's interesting, but I don't believe it for a minute. Why? Because it didn't bother him enough to stop, did it? Perhaps he identified more to that young man than other older victims because they were age mates. And of course, there's always the chance that he was lying when he said that. And I'm just going to say, my money is on the lying. If I asked you how many subscriptions you have, would you be able to list all of them and how much you're paying? If you would have asked me this question before I started using Rocket Money, I would have said yes, but let me tell you, I would have been so wrong. I can't believe how many I had and all the money I was wasting. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. That's rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. Rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. Graham was smart and good-looking, so the world was his oyster. Or perhaps I should say it could have been. Clearly, had he been more careful, more circumspect about killing people so close to him, he might have gotten away with his murders. But that would not have turned him on, would not have satisfied his sadistic need to see and hear about his victim's suffering. In contrast is the Tylenol murderer of 1982. That killer created the poison capsules, put them in Tylenol bottles and boxes, then distributed them at various stores in suburban Chicago. Then he left. He could not possibly have known who would buy the tainted pills or who would consume them once they left the store. Unlike Graham, he was not a witness to his victim's death. He did not need to see them suffer. Why? Because his motivation to poison strangers was very complex and vastly different from Graham's. By the way, we covered the Tylenol murders in season one of Killer Psyche. Graham pled not guilty to each crime he was charged with. He was confident that because his previous conviction could not be used against him in court, he would be acquitted. He was wrong. After reviewing his crimes in light of his previous conviction at the age of 14, the British Home Secretary launched an inquiry into the rehabilitation process and monitoring of released dangerous individuals. The inquiry led to the formation of the British Advisory Board on Restricted Patients, which monitors the release process. 
I truly hope for the safety of the 67 million plus people living in Great Britain today that the advisory board's policies work and that they now prevent future Graham Youngs. On June 29, 1972, Graham Young was convicted on all counts and received four life sentences for his crimes. On August 1st, 1990, at 42 years old, he died of a heart attack. Well, that's what's on the record anyway. Rumor has it that it was not a heart attack at all, but rather a lethal dose of poison concocted by a group of inmates and guards who were afraid he might poison them. If true, this rumor might actually make me believe that karma is a real thing. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and produced by Lisa Ammerman and Julie Burke. Additional writing and director of research is Anne Liu. Mix and sound design by Joshua Morales. Head of audio, Tom Monahan. With audio assistance from Katie Corpy and Matt Dyson. Jada Williams is our production coordinator. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Dito. From Amazon Music and Wondery, the producer is Stephanie Wachnin. And the co-executive producer is Julie Burke. Lastly, our executive producers are myself, Candace DeLong, Kelly Garner, and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort, and Marshall Louie and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. Hi, listeners. I'm Donnie Dust, and I'm here to tell you about our new podcast, Rescue. Go deep into the heart of the world's most astonishing rescue stories told by the people who were there. I'll never forget his words to me. They struck me like a knife. He said, Billy, nine guys are missing, and we think they're trapped under your farm. Marvel at the lengths people will go to preserve the most sacred of things, life. At any point, the transmission's going to quit, and we're going to crash in the water, and we're going to die. Because... Once the engines quit, we probably wouldn't survive. Join me, Donnie Dust, for Rescue. Defying fate, defining heroes. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.